What is the best type of laser engraver for beginners? Well, it depends. Generally speaking, there are three different types of lasers available to consumers today, and they are diode lasers, CO2 lasers, and fiber or galvo lasers. But within each type of laser, there are multiple tiers with different prices and features among them. And yes, this can make the choosing process a little bit overwhelming. So today I'm going to attempt to save you some time and stress by giving you the beginner's guide to choosing your first laser engraver that I wish I had when I was prepping to get my very first laser machine. And specifically, I'll be covering the following four points for each type of laser. Number one, what defines it? In other words, what makes a diode laser a diode laser? Number two, I'll talk about the overall pros and cons for that type of laser. Number three, I'll talk about the different tiers and their different features, including their price ranges. And number four, I'll close out each type of laser section by talking about my general recommendations for beginners. So let's begin with the type of laser that I got for my first machine and that would be diode lasers. Here we have one example of a 10, 20, and 40 watt diode laser module. So first things first, what makes a diode laser a diode laser? Well, it comes down to two main things. Number one, the source of the laser, and the source of the laser for these is appropriately a tiny device called a diode. Now, I think it's helpful to know that this is basically the same technology that's used in laser pointers. However, the maximum wattage output for a tiny device like this is usually five to six watts. So you might be wondering, how did they get these higher powered wattages out of these machines? Well, what they do is they just put multiple diodes inside of the module and combine the beams with little mirrors. And the second defining characteristic of a diode laser is actually the wavelength. So the wavelength of a diode laser is typically going to be around 455 nanometers, which is in the visible light spectrum. And so it does produce a blue colored light. Now, before we go through the different tiers for this type of laser, let's first talk some general pros and cons for diode lasers. Number one, they are the cheapest type of laser engraver on the market today. And number two, they are quite easy to maintain in my experience. I've gone months of heavy use with a machine like this without actually cleaning the lenses. You should do it much more often than that but I didn't really have any serious issues with it as a result. And so in my experience, it's actually pretty easy to keep this type of machine up and running. They also have a larger working space compared to fiber lasers. And if you get an extended diode laser like this one you see here, then they can even be a little bit bigger than some smaller desktop CO2 units. They also have a smaller laser dot size compared to CO2 lasers. And so they can also give you more detailed engravings for things like photo engraving. And number five, because the laser source is actually inside this little neat module package, sometimes you can get swappable laser heads. So for example, my 10, 20, and 40 watt laser head modules will all work in my silver X-Tool laser gantry here. Or you could also for something like the X-Tool S1, for example, you could get a infrared wavelength laser module that you can swap in. And now this is operating at the same wavelength as a fiber laser, which allows you to do some metal engraving. It's not exactly the same. And so we'll talk a little bit more about fiber lasers and their wavelength later, but it is kind of cool that there are some different options for swappable laser heads. Now let's talk about the cons of diode lasers. They are the slowest type of laser machine. So if you are running a booming laser business, you will probably eventually need to upgrade to a different type of laser. However, you can get pretty far with diode lasers alone. In fact, as an example of that, I grew my laser business from zero all the way up to over 6K in revenue per month using nothing but a diode laser. Number two, you can't engrave glass without painting it. You can make it work if you do painting and figure out the technique for doing it, but it's a lot harder and less efficient than engraving glass with something like a CO2 laser. Similarly, number three is you can't cut or engrave translucent acrylic on a diode laser, for example, clear, and even cutting something like opaque opaque white acrylic is pretty difficult. Black works pretty good, but these other sort of more transparent colors are pretty tricky with a diode machine. Number four is you can't really engrave metal. However, you can still do some of the popular projects that you might think of when it comes to metal. For example, if you want to engrave painted tumblers that have a coating over the metal, you can still do that. Or for example, a painted business card that has metal on the bottom, you can do that because what you're engraving is actually the paint coating and not what's underneath, which is the metal itself. Now let's talk tiers. As I would describe it, there are basically three tiers of diode lasers in order of cheapest to most expensive. And the cheapest one is your open frame diode laser. Now these can be as cheap as $200 for a small watt unit like this one, all the way up to somewhere around $1,500 for a very powerful 70 watt unit like this one from Atomstack. The second tier of diode lasers is probably the one that you've heard the least about, and that is a diode laser module that can mount on an existing CNC machine. So for example, I had a student in my diode laser bootcamp 
who actually had a JTEC Photonics kit, kind of like this one you see here, that he had mounted on his existing CNC machine so that he could work with half sheets of plywood. Third and finally, we have enclosed diode lasers like the Raleigh Lasermatic 2 or the Xtool S1. Now these are the type of diode lasers that basically get all the bells and whistles. You of course get the enclosure itself, which is an important safety feature, and it makes it so you don't have to buy or build your own enclosure like I had to do back in the day. Plus you can get some really cool, nice to have features like a camera to help with positioning and light burn, an autofocus, or even technology that allows you to engrave on curved surfaces. And this kind of enclosed diode laser is actually my default recommendation for anybody who asks me as a beginner what kind of laser they should buy, and this is for four main reasons. Number one, as a diode laser, they're an affordable way to get into the laser engraver game. Number two, they can do the majority of popular laser projects like engraving tumblers, engraving slate coasters, doing plywood cutouts, or engraving on wood. Number three, the enclosed versions are both safer and easier to set up and get going with compared to the other tiers of diode lasers we talked about. And number four, they are a great entry point into lasers in general because a lot of the skills you'll learn using a diode laser are actually transferable to other types of lasers that you might switch to in the future. And if you're like, okay, great, I'm sold, let me get a diode laser, then I would recommend for most beginners that you actually start with a 10 watt unit. And you might be surprised to hear that because you can get much more powerful units, 40 or even 70 watts on a diode laser machine today. And there's actually a few reasons why I think it's better to start with something a little bit lower power. So number one, they are much cheaper, right? A 10 watt unit is gonna be hundreds of dollars cheaper than something like a 40 watt machine. But they're not just cheap. A 10 watt unit is actually surprisingly capable. You can cut through quarter inch plywood. I've done it many, many times on my 10 watt D1 Pro and it works really good. You get nice clean cuts. And also, there are even some things a 10 watt unit does better than higher powered modules. For example, photo engraving is a really good example of this. When I do photo engravings and I want them to turn out really detailed and really nice, I tend to use my 10 watt module even though I have a 40 watt module right next to it because the spot size on the laser is smaller and as a result, you can get smaller detail in the engravings which gives you a more detailed and more accurate photo engraving. But with all of that said, the most popular type of laser for years has actually been CO2 lasers. And so let's go ahead and talk about that type next. So what makes a CO2 laser a CO2 laser? Well, again, it comes down to two main things. Number one is the source of the laser. So for a CO2 laser, it's going to be coming from a tube that is filled with carbon dioxide or CO2, and that's where the name comes from. Now, most of the time, the tube itself is going to be made of glass, like you see here on my Xtool P2. However, there are in higher end machines, also sometimes the option to get tubes made of metal or of ceramic, and these have their own advantages. And the second defining trait of a CO2 laser is its wavelength, which is going to be around 10,640 nanometers. So unlike a diode laser where the source of the laser is produced entirely inside of the module, the laser on a CO2 machine is actually produced inside of the tube, and then it is brought to the nozzle of the machine using precisely aligned mirrors. Now with the definitions out of the way, let's talk pros and cons. Pro number one of a CO2 laser is if you're going to be doing a lot of cutting, then a CO2 machine is going to be the best and fastest for most types of popular materials, like wood, plywood, acrylic, that sort of thing. And number two, it's probably the most versatile type of laser when it comes to doing different types of materials. So like a diode laser, it can do a lot of things like wood, it can do plywood, it can engrave on slate, but in addition to those things, it can also do a really good job on acrylic. And in fact, it is the best type of laser if you plan to work with a lot of acrylic or clear materials like glass. CO2 lasers also offer the largest working area. So for example, the largest of the Thunder Nova lasers available on the market is about 63 by 39 inches, which is just massive. But size can also be a downside, and that brings me to the cons of CO2 lasers. Number one, they tend to have a pretty large footprint, especially compared to diode and fiber lasers, which tend to be smaller machines. Number two is maintenance. This can be a bit more of a hassle when compared to diode and fiber lasers. For example, when you first get a CO2 machine, you will likely need to align the mirrors and you'll also need to clean the mirrors and also the lens very frequently. And it could be as frequent as every day, depending on how often you use your machine. And this is actually a lesson that I personally learned the hard way because I didn't clean my lens fast enough and I destroyed it on my Xtool P2, as you can see in this image here. Con number three is that higher wattage models could require a dedicated 20 amp circuit. And so if you don't already have one of these, which a lot of people may not, then you might have to hire an electrician to get a new outlet 
and a new breaker installed in your electrical panel, and that can be a hassle that not everyone will want to go through to get one of these machines. And as I've alluded to before, they also have a larger laser spot size, which means they're less precise for things like photo engraving when compared to diode lasers. All right, now let's talk tiers. Now there is the most amount of variety when it comes to CO2 laser tiers, and so I've broken it down into six, and I'll describe what each of these are here. Again, going in order from least to most expensive, the first tier here is the K40 laser. Now, if you've never heard of one of these before, here's an example from Monport. These typically cost $300 to around $700 for a 40 watt machine with a working area that's usually around 12 inches by eight inches, which is pretty small. K40s also have a reputation for requiring some tinkering and playing around with them in order to get them set up and running the way that you want. And this is really a bare bones unit. This is the cheapest way to get into CO2 lasers. So that's basically the K40 unit. Next up, we have what I'd call desktop CO2 units. So this would be something like the Xtool P2 or the Omtech Polar. These are gonna give you around 50 watts of power for anywhere from 2000 to $4,000. The idea here is that you get a compact machine that requires less tinkering and is more polished and has more features compared to the K40 laser. Glowforge would also fall into this category, though they are much more expensive than these other examples I've mentioned, and they also lock you into their own proprietary software, so I personally wouldn't go for one of those. Tier number three is what I'll call the entry-level floor standing units. So for example, the Omtech Maker Series would be in this category, and also something like the 60-watt Monport unit would both fall into this tier. This type of machine can cost anywhere from $2,000 to 6,000 plus dollars. And for that, you're gonna get anywhere from 50 to 100 watts of power. And I don't have one of these machines myself, but if you go online, you'll quickly find that there are some complaints for this category of machine that are complaining about poor customer service, having a hard time getting in touch with people at the company, or even poor quality control on the machines that are shipped. As a result, if you buy a machine like this, you should be prepared to get your hands a little bit dirty and maybe even do some troubleshooting on your own to get your machine running the way that you want when you're shopping in this tier. The next tier is what I would call your prosumer desktop unit, and that would be something like a Thunderbolt or Thunderbolt Plus, or even something like the Aeon Mira 5S. These are gonna cost anywhere from five to $7,000 and on the Aeon units, you're gonna get a 45 watt glass tube, but on the Thunderbolt, you're actually getting a metal tube that is about 30 watts. And Thunder claims that that is equivalent to around 60 watts if it were a glass tube. The basic idea behind a machine like this is maybe you have limited space, but you want a machine that is reliable and capable enough to do production run type things for a side hustle, or maybe you already have a laser business going and you want to add an additional machine that is dedicated to a specific purpose. So maybe you would buy a machine like this to just do tumblers, for example. But anyway, we're gonna talk more about Thunder and Aeon in the next tier, which is actually your prosumer floor model. Examples of lasers in this tier include the Thunder Nova 35 or the Aeon Nova 10S. Yes, they do both use Nova in their names for this type of line for some reason. Now, this is where we're getting into pretty serious professional machines here. And so you're gonna be spending anywhere from 10,000 all the way to well over $15,000 for a machine like this. And for that price, you're getting a laser that has a wide anywhere from 80 to 150 watts. Now you might notice that the size and the wattages of this type of machine are actually pretty similar to what we saw in an earlier tier for those floor standing entry level units. But the idea here is that the quality of the product and also the customer service and the features available are all dialed up when you get into this floor standing prosumer tier. And speaking of customer service, I actually watched this video from a channel here on YouTube called Crafting with Felicia, where they went to the 2024 International Sign Expo and there they were able to talk with reps from both Thunder and Aeon as well as some other laser manufacturers. And they asked both of them, why somebody should buy their brand of laser versus one of the other options on the market. And both Aeon and Thunder heavily emphasize customer service. And that's something that you definitely hear online as well from real customers who have talked about their experiences with both Thunder and Aeon. And just so you know, I'm not sponsored by either of these companies and I actually don't even have one of their lasers, but that seems to be the general sentiment among real customers of both of these brands. Thunder and Aeon if you go and look around online. But anyway, the sixth and final tier that we're gonna talk about in this video is what I'll call your industrial tier. So this is gonna be manufacturers like Epilog and Trotec that maybe you've heard of, and the cheapest unit for both of these companies that I've been able to find online is $10,000, and for anything else, you basically have to request a quote. 
So that tells me that it's gonna be well over $10,000 for most of their machines, which is probably well over the price range of most people looking for their first laser engraver. And as for my general recommendation, I still do think an enclosed diode laser is actually the sweet spot for most beginners. However, if you plan to work mostly with acrylic or if you want a CO2 laser specifically for some other reason, then I think the easiest one to recommend for beginners is actually going to be one of your entry-level desktop units like an Omtech Polar or an X-Tool P2. There are definitely some things that I personally don't like about this type of laser. For example, they typically have a built-in air assist pump and exhaust fan that in my opinion are not nearly powerful enough. Long story short, these entry-level desktop CO2 lasers are not perfect, but they are probably still the best beginner CO2 laser for four main reasons. Number one, they're much cheaper than most other types of CO2 lasers. Number two, they are easier to use than K40 lasers. Number three, they don't take up a ton of space. Number four, they may not require a dedicated 20 amp circuit like more powerful lasers would. For example, I run my X-Tool P2 off of a normal 15 amp circuit without any issues, but of course I'm not an electrician, so don't take my word for it. And with that all said, we have one more type of laser to cover, and that is your fiber or galvo laser. So what makes a fiber laser a fiber laser? In this case, it is three main things. Number one, this type of laser uses fiber optics to amplify light, and that is where the fiber name comes from. Number two is the wavelength, and this is typically going to be 1064 or 1064 nanometers, which is infrared light. And number three, they typically use a galvanometer system, which quickly adjusts tiny mirrors in order to aim the laser. And that's why this type of machine is also sometimes called a galvo laser. And that also means that the head of a fiber laser is stationary, which is different than a diode or CO2 laser, where the laser head is actually moving all the way around a workspace using a gantry system. Now let's talk pros and cons. So the main pros of a fiber laser is number one, they are the fastest at engraving of any type of laser. Number two is that they can engrave metal, which is actually the main reason that most people would buy a fiber laser for. And number three is that MOPA fiber lasers, which is a particular type that we'll talk more about in a second, can actually engrave in color, which is really cool. <laughs> and as for the cons, number one is that they have a very small working area compared to diode and CO2 lasers. Number two is that consumer models of fiber lasers are really not practical for doing any kind of cutting. And so if you want to cut anything out, a CO2 or a diode laser is going to work better for that. And number three, fiber lasers are a little bit more complex to use than a CO2 or a diode machine. And there's probably a few more pros and cons to this type of machine, but I don't have one myself. So that's all I've got for now. And we'll move on to the tiers here quickly. As I see it, there are three main tiers to fiber lasers. First of all, you have your infrared dual lasers. This would be something like the X-Tool F1 or the Laser Pecker 4. This type of machine has really low powered infrared laser modules in them. For example, both those examples I mentioned have two watt infrared lasers, but both of the examples also have embedded in them diode lasers so that you can do more variety of engravings on your machine. And so that's why I called them infrared dual lasers because they actually have two different types of lasers inside of them. At the time of recording this video, this type of machine is going to cost you around $1,500, but personally, I'm not sure it really qualifies as a real quote unquote fiber laser. It does have the characteristic wavelength of 1064 nanometers, and it also has the galvanometer system that you would see in a fiber laser, but I don't think any type of fiber optics are actually being used in this type of machine. But it is an affordable way to get into small scale metal engraving. So with that said, let's just go ahead and move on to the next tier. And here we have what's called a Q-switch, which is basically your standard fiber laser. Now, examples of this include this Omtec or this CloudRay model, for these, you're going to be getting around 20 to 50 watts, and it's going to cost you anywhere from $1,500 to $4,000 plus dollars. This is basically the entry level into the real fiber laser category. And the third tier we have here are what is called MOPA fiber lasers. So here is a CloudRay and a Omtec example of these. This kind of machine is going to give you anywhere from 20 all the way up to 100 watts of power, and it's going to cost you anywhere from $3,000 all the way up to $9,000 plus dollars. MOPA lasers give you a larger range of frequencies to work with, which is what allows you to do color engravings on metal. Now, technically a standard or Q-switch fiber laser can do some colors as well, but MOPA lasers are much better at it. And as for my general recommendation when it comes to fiber lasers, what I would first suggest that you do is to check whether the type of projects that you wanna do can actually be done on a diode laser. So for example, you might be thinking of tumblers. Tumblers are made of metal, but oftentimes they are powder coated with paint. And by engraving off that layer of paint, you might actually be able to do that project on a diode laser. So if that's the case and you think all of the projects that you want to do can actually be done on that type of machine, then I would say actually the sweet spot for beginners is still that enclosed diode laser style that we talked about earlier in the video. But even if you can't do the type of metal engraving that you want on a standard diode laser, remember that some of these systems, for example, this X-Tool S1 has the ability to purchase a separate infrared 
laser head module that you can swap into your system to allow you to do some small time metal engraving. But choosing your first laser is really just the beginning and there's way more to learn like light burn or other laser software and how to stop scorching and things of this nature. And if you didn't know it already, this video you're watching right now is actually one part of a six part laser engraving mini course that I'm putting up here on YouTube. So if you wanna watch the entire thing and learn more about these various laser topics, then you can check it out in this little card I'll put up right here. So just click or tap on that and I'll hopefully see you on the next one. Bye now.